as mentioned, my name is Corey Kreidler. I am a sophomore here at FNM with an intended major in animal behavior. My love for animals is actually what brought me here to Franklin and Marshall, as it is one of few schools where you can actually study animal behavior as a major. Growing up, I was particularly interested in marine mammals. I would spend hours in my room reading books about marine life over and over again. Trips to zoos and aquariums were where I formed some of my fondest childhood memories. During my first trip to SeaWorld when I was six years old, I was able to experience my love for marine life up close. Opportunities like this are once in a lifetime, but at what price do these captive animals have to pay for humans to have experiences such as these? My interest in animals grew as I got older, and so did my curiosity about places like SeaWorld where animals are kept in captivity. The first time I watched the film Blackfish, I was shocked to learn about the many stresses captive cetaceans face. The stories about captive animals that you will hear about today changed my outlook on marine mammal captivity. I was inspired to learn more about the solutions for this problem, which is how I discovered the wonderful work of Dr. Lori Marino. Lori Marino is a neuroscientist and expert in animal behavior and intelligence. She is also the founder and executive director of the Camilla Center for Animal Advocacy, which focuses on bridging the gap between academic scholarship and on-the-ground animal advocacy efforts. Dr. Marino is internationally known for her work on the evolution of the brain in dolphins and whales. She has published over 130 peer-reviewed papers, book chapters, and magazine articles on marine mammal biology and cognition, as well as marine mammal captivity issues, such as dolphin-assisted therapy. In 2001, she co-authored a groundbreaking study offering the first conclusive evidence for mere self-recognition in bottlenose dolphins, after which she decided against further research using captive animals. Dr. Marino has been featured as a National Geographic innovator. She's appeared in several films and television programs, including the documentary Blackfish about orca captivity and Unlocking the Cage, a film on the non-human rights project of which she worked on for two years as lead scientist. Today, Dr. Marino will be talking about her role as the president of the Whale Sanctuary Project. This project aims to establish a model seaside sanctuary for captive orcas and beluga whales in North America. I believe this sanctuary has the potential to give captive cetaceans a chance of what has been unfairly taken away from them, a chance to live freely in an enclosure that reflects their natural habitat. Before I introduce Dr. Marino to speak, I would like to take a second to thank the sponsors of today's common hour. Many thanks to the Center for the Sustainable Environment, the Psychology Department, the Public Policy Program, Brooks College House, and the Biological Foundations of Behavior Program for making today's common hour possible. I would also like to personally thank Professor Bayshaw for mentoring me through the common hour proposal and planning process. Also, an invite to everyone, please join us this evening at 445 for a reception in the Brooks College House Great Room. And with all that being said, it is an honor for me to introduce Dr. Lori Marino. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. And I really appreciate being invited to talk to all of you. And I uh, really want to thank Corey for reaching out over a year ago as a student with a lot of enthusiasm and uh, really appreciate uh, any kind of passion like that in, in students. So it's, it's great, thank you. Uh, today I'm gonna tell you a little bit about captive dolphins and whales, but also about uh, who they are. So um, the first, we're gonna sort of take this in three steps. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about who are dolphins and whales? Who are these animals? Um, what is their well-being in marine parks and aquariums? What does the science tell us about how well they fare? And third, I'm gonna tell you about an alternative to the concrete tanks that I'm working on with many of my colleagues, uh, seaside sanctuaries, uh, which we view as really a better future for all. And when I say all, I mean not only dolphins and whales, but humans as well. I'll explain what I mean later. So who are dolphins and whales? 
Everybody is interested in them, but what do we know about them? Well, they were members of a mammalian order called Cetacea. And what you see here is a very simple phylogeny. Modern cetaceans uh, consist of two suborders, the odontocetes and the mysticetes, and we're going to focus on the odontocetes today. There was an ancient suborder of early dolphins and whales called Archaeocete, ancient whale, and they died out about 30 million years ago. And on the far right, you see the closest living relative to dolphins and whales, the hippopotamus. The land ancestors of cetaceans adopted an aquatic lifestyle about 50 to 55 million years ago. And what you see on the lower left is Pachycetus, which is an artist rendering of who we think the ancestor of all dolphins and whales was. Um, this was a land animal that lived in, the, in Pakistan, or at least that's where we find fossils. And if you look at the end of this animal's, this furry animal's uh, feet, what you see there are hooves. They're not claws, they're hooves. And that's how we know that dolphins and whales are related to hooved animals. Um, in the middle, you see Ambulocetus, the walking whale. And Ambulocetus uh, has characteristics of both land animals and aquatic animals. And uh, a lot of tr what's known as transitional features showing a really beautiful example of evolution and adaptation. And on the far right, you see the first modern dolphins who emerged about 30 million years ago. And what's interesting, as, as we found, is that when you look at the fossil record going back about 50, 55 million years ago, so Ambulocetus uh, went extinct, and in came, uh, later on came a lot of the early modern forms. But modern dolphins and whales haven't really changed all that much in about 15 million years. Now, part of that might be just difficulty in resolving the fossil record, but you know, it seems to be that you know, they have been swimming around with their big brains and their, their, their body, their streamlined bodies, pretty much in stasis for the past 15 million years. So let's hone in. Let's talk about odontocetes. I just want to make sure. Odontocetes consist of about 76 different species in six families. And today, I'm going to uh, focus upon uh, the delphinids, the true dolphins, and the monodontids, which which are the belugas and the narwhals. So within those groups, I'm going to be talking about orcas, or killer whales. And they are actually the largest dolphin. And beluga whales, who are known as the canaries of the sea. So. Here are three important facts about dolphins and whales. One, they're ridiculously smart. Two, they love to travel and they love to dive. Three, they are highly social and cultural beings. And yes, cultural. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about who they are and tell you a little bit about the evidence for these three facts, and then ask you a question. Let's take a look at their intelligence. So I've been studying dolphin and whale brains for 25 years, uh, mainly or all, you know, entirely from animals, individuals who have uh, died naturally or have died in aquariums. And uh, there's lots of ways to study the brain. The way I do it is I get the whole brain and I do a lot of magnetic resonance imaging studies and studies of that nature to look at the size of the different parts of the brain, the proportions, the organization of the brains, 
and so forth, and we've characterized a number of different O'Donoghue brains. Here are some things about the brains of O'Donoghue's, and uh, in particular, orcas and belugas. What you see there is a killer whale, an orca brain, compared to a human brain. And yes, that's a bigger brain, but of course they have a bigger body. So what you do is you take a look at how big is that brain compared with the size of the brain you'd expect for a body of that size. And it turns out that if you look at orca brains, uh, beluga whale brains, they're about 2.3 to 2.5 times larger than you would expect, even for an animal of that body size. Now, for some of the other dolphins, like the bottlenose dolphin, we're talking about four and a half, um, they're the closest to us in terms of their relative brain size to body size. So they're really way up there, and even um, many of them uh, beyond uh, the, the uh, great apes, our closest relatives. Now, the thing about this brain is that it has an expanded neocortex. And if, if any of you have taken biology, neurobiology, psychology, you know the neocortex is that wrinkled part of the outer part of the brain, and it's the evolutionarily newest part of the brain. It's where a lot of higher order integrative thinking goes. It's where there's a lot of sensory and motor integration, problem solving, uh, self-awareness, and so forth, processing of social cognition and emotions. Dolphin and whale brains are among the most convoluted, meaning that they've packed a lot of neocortex into their brain over evolutionary time. And their neocortex itself is highly differentiated. And that's a fancy way of saying that they have a very complex cellular organization. So this is a big brain. There's lots of it, highly expanded, and a lot of organizational complexity. We used to think dolphin and whale brains were big, but kind of like just a giant ball of silly putty, uh, but that's not the case anymore. We know that from a number of studies that this is a very intricate, complex brain with a lot of different connections. Now, here's an example of a study we've done. It's been since replicated. The adult orca brain is the most convoluted brain on the planet and that's an adult orca brain there. The forebrain, the part that consists of the, the neocortex, consists of a greater proportion of the total brain volume than it does in humans. And so, to put that in context, as humans, modern humans, we all love our big brains. We love the fact that we have a lot of gray matter in between our ears, and we love the fact that our neocortex is so wrinkled because we've had to jam all this tissue in there. Well, guess what? The orca has us beat on all of those particular features. So if we want to say that we're really smart because of those features of the brain, then if you look at those features of the brain in an orca, you have to draw the conclusion that they may be even smarter or doing something more sophisticated than we are. Um, on the right, you'll see an MRI image uh, from one of our studies. It's just a cross-section through the brain of an orca. And it shows you some interesting features, how deep those clefts are. And in particular, this region here, the paralimbic cleft, which I talked about in blackfish, um, which is something quite unique to cetacean brains and which has a very interesting, uh, compelling location in the brain between the limbic region and the superlimbic region and may, just we're just inferring, have something to do with the way they uh, are able to process emotions in a social context. We don't know. We haven't done functional studies of this area, but it's very elaborated and a very, very interesting part of their neuroanatomy. 
So they're smart. Whether they're actually smarter than us or we're smarter than them, at the level that we're talking about, that's not even an interesting question, really, because we're talking about a very smart, complex being. Um, and, and each species has its own particular adaptations. When you look at adaptations, you also see that they love to travel and they love to dive. Um, you know, orcas and belugas dive very deep and they travel 70 to 100 miles a day. Now, to get to the third part, the social part, uh, we know from years of study of orcas uh, in particular that they live in strongly bonded, complex social networks shaped by deep-seated cultural traditions. Those cultural traditions manifest themselves as dialects, certain foraging uh, behaviors, and a number of other ways that they separate themselves on the basis of culture, learn traditions, they have complex uh, alliances, lifelong social bonds. Many orca populations are matrilineal. Um, they're the only an other animal that we know of that has menopause, and they live in very complex social networks. So here are three examples. On the top is a greeting ceremony in which whales uh, in the San Juan Islands are lining up, and I, I actually got to see this in person a few years ago, in two opposing rows, um, the two different pods, and they face each other, and then at some point, usually it's the older female that gives the signal, um, they all start sort of this big giant mosh pit uh, party, and they jump up in the air and they play with each other, but beforehand, there is this very formal greeting ceremony, um, and then when the, mat the matriarch decides, that's when they mingle. Um, in the middle, you'll see an example of cooperative hunting, a pod of Antarctic workers preparing to wave wash a Weddell seal, unfortunate seal, on an ice floe. Um, but what those orcas will do is they'll back up and on, again, some signal that requires a coordination of communication, they all rush towards the flow, creating a wave that washes the seal into the mouth of one of them. Now, not everybody gets to eat the seal, but they work cooperatively as any society does, where sometimes you get the food, sometimes somebody else gets the food, and they keep track of that. And on the bottom is a mother orca teaching her child to hunt seals on the shore. So there's a lot of learning. Their juvenile period is about as long as ours. The mothers, the males, I call the ultimate mama's boys because they stay with their moms their whole entire life. So if the mother dies or is separated from them, he goes into a deep depression, and if he's not adopted by somebody else, he could die. And there are cases of adult male orcas who are healthy, dying after a deep depression when their mother dies. So social, they take social bonding to, to quite an extraordinary level, these animals. Now, beluga whales, I would have to say, I don't know, it's a toss-up between whether they or dol bottlenose dolphins are the cheekiest cetaceans in the world. Uh, if you've worked with both of them, you know that the two of them, the minute you meet them, they're thinking, what can I do to get over on this person? And beluga whales are incredible. They live in complex societies. And they are known as the canaries of the sea because they are master imitators of sounds. Um, there's a famous beluga whale who used to be held in a tank by the Navy. His name was Nock. He imitated human speech. Uh, and uh, those were the, the speech of his trainers. Um, when I worked with beluga whales in Coney Island, 
They would imitate the sound of the elevated train <laughs> as it came in, and you'd look up, you'd think a train was coming, but no, it was just the belugas. They do that. <laughs> And they manipulate objects. As you can see, they create beautiful bubble rings of all kinds. So do bottlenose dolphins. Uh, they love to do things like spit water at you. And I mean, these are not trained SeaWorld type behaviors. This is just cheeky stuff that they love to do. They have a real sense of humor. And there's a mother uh, with the baby. There's a lot of taking care of each other's calves in a beluga pod. Now here's here just to give you sort of an impression of what it's like to be, for instance, an orca free in British Columbia. I'm just gonna play this very short, brief video and listen at, to the sounds as well. So that's who orcas are. If you go out in British Columbia on a boat, which I've done, you know, you'll see orcas in the distance if you're lucky, and, and that's what you see. And, and traveling families, sometimes with babies, communicating, obviously traveling with intent somewhere. Um, and it's really important to note that there has never been a single encounter between a human and an, a wild orca in the wild that where there was any injury to the human, let alone any death or anything. It just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. And I know people who get in the water with the orcas, they, they have, there is just never a case where an orca would attack a human in the wild. So now I want to switch to the next section, which is the following. And this is my question to you. Can beings like this thrive in concrete tanks? So just to give you a brief overview of how many dolphins and whales are in captivity around the world, um, there are about 3,000, and in terms of belugas, there are about 80 in North America and 25 orcas in North America. And as Corey mentioned, the film Blackfish in 2013 really was a watershed moment for uh, the public's understanding of who orcas are and what they endure in these concrete tanks. Here's an example of the kinds of limitations that they have to contend with in a tank. On the left is uh, a graphic. They're both graphics, one in captivity, one in the wild. And it is true that an orca at SeaWorld, which has the largest tanks, would have to swim the circumference of the main pool 1,400 times to match the equivalent daily distance traveled in the wild. Here's an example of someone who's up in Marineland, Canada. Her name is Kiska. She's been alone for six years. So what I just told you about orcas, think about what it would be like to be all alone for six years, literally all alone. She was captured from Iceland. She's 42 years old. She has, been, she has been pregnant, she's had six babies, and she's watched six babies die. That's Kiska, and this is where she is now. So who are they? 
They're smart. But in concrete tanks, they have no stimulation, no challenges. They like to travel and dive, but in concrete tanks, there's nowhere for them to go. And they are highly social and cultural beings. But in amusement parks, they are kept in artificial social groupings. Calves are taken away from their mother when they're two, three, four, five years old. And often, as you saw in the case of Kiska, they are kept in solitude. So from the science, the welfare science, what do we know about the impacts of living like this on orcas, bottlenose dolphins, and beluga whales? Well, chronic stress-related physiological, anatomical, and psychological conditions are common, pervasive. It's fair to say that living in a concrete tank is a disaster for these animals. And I hope you can see why. So we see, uh, for instance, um, a number of diseases reported. Failure to thrive, that's a baby beluga whale uh, at Georgia Aquarium who was born last year. She lived about a month. And then her mother, Maris, died shortly after that, after having two two daughters that lived about a month, and then Maris passed away. We still don't know the official reason why. Um, pneumonia, lung diseases, very common source of mortality. We see candidiasis, yeast infections. We never see these in free-ranging orca populations. This is due to the diet uh, the, of constant antibiotics and antifungals that they give them so that they become resistant to these medicines. Uh, we see a lot of gastric ulcers and stomach diseases and cancer. We also see a lot of behavioral stereotypies. For those of you in psychology, you know that this is just purposeless behavior that is usually brought on by emotional distress, things like circling around the tank, self-mutilation, damaged teeth from grating their teeth on the gates, if you all remember Tilikum, the, the orca that lived in SeaWorld in Orlando, who was the subject of blackfish, those are his teeth when he was alive. He grated his teeth on the gate, the iron gate, so far down that he had no teeth. And his teeth had to be drilled out and flushed out every day to prevent infection. They also have poor muscular condition and there's a lot of hyperaggression uh, towards other orcas, including calves and humans. And trainers have died, or other cetaceans have died. Um, that's an example of Corky versus Candu. Corky, who is still alive in San Diego, rammed Candu because there's nowhere for them to go to dissipate the stress. They Literally, butted heads, can do, was rammed. Her jaw was broken and she bled out in front of the whole audience and died while her daughter watched. Um, we see failure to attach and poor parenting and just overall depression. So these are the kinds of things we know happen to dolphins and whales in amusement parks. And as bleak as that picture is, I want to ask you, the audience, another question that I'm also concerned with. What is the impact of concrete tanks on both cetaceans and humans? We know what the impact is on cetaceans. I have just showed you the impact. What's the impact psychologically, culturally, emotionally on a child coming to see a magnificent creature like this behind glass in a tank going around and around and around. We don't have a lot of good data on that, but the data that does exist suggests that it's not good. And at the very least, seeing animals on display like that actually reduces people's concerns about their wild counterparts. So far from being an educational experience or one that really promotes conservation, 
we have some evidence now that it does just the opposite. And so the question becomes, uh, you know, really, what are we doing to children when we bring them to places like this? What are we telling them about our relationship with other animals? So with all of that said, I want to sort of talk about something that is much more positive uh, that we are trying to do to change uh, the way we relate to these animals, and that is the Whale Sanctuary Project, which we see as really a shift, a better way to have a relationship with other animals, a better future for all. So when you think about captive animals, what is really the alternative except the zoo or a circus? Um, well, they're a sanctuary, sanctuaries for elephants, chimpanzees, tigers, lions, bears. There's permanent sanctuaries for all kinds of animals with the exception of one. There are none yet for cetaceans. Here's our concept of what a whale sanctuary would look like. It's just a rendering, but it contains a lot of the features that we think provide an opportunity for any dolphins or whales in this facility to do something they don't have an opportunity to do in the concrete tanks, and that is thrive. That's the word, thrive. Nobody wants to just exist, we want to thrive. How do you thrive? By having the opportunity to do so. So we have been looking um, at different sites, uh, a cove or a bay, at something like at least 65 to 70 uh, meters, uh, acres or more, something that has enough depth so that they can dive, something that could be partitioned, um, and we have a number of other criteria, um, but we have a team of people who know how to build this, and um, we think that if we can get these animals out of the concrete tanks into something like this, that they will, for the first time, have an opportunity to thrive. Now, just to show you by comparison, you see that little white square there? Well, that's the largest tank at SeaWorld. The largest tank anywhere in the world that an orca has as space, compared with just one section of our sanctuary, our future sanctuary. So what are the characteristics of an authentic sanctuary? Well, again, as I said, it's a place to thrive. Um, and it's a place to model change in our relationship to these animals. So again, it's not just about them, it's about children, bringing up the next generation, having respect for other animals, not seeing them as commodities. Whale well-being is the priority, individualized care, restoration to a natural life as much as possible, you can't do everything, lifetime care, no breeding, no invasive procedures, no exploitation, promotion of choice and autonomy, education and conservation, transparency and sustainability. If you go to a place and it says we're, we're, we're a tiger sanctuary and they're breeding the tigers, it's not a sanctuary, it's a zoo. Here are some of the exciting things that we're going to do from an educational and outreach perspective. We're gonna have visitor education, but the visitors will be able to see the animals from a distance. There will be no interaction. We're looking into different kinds of immersive and interactive virtual reality displays. We'll have webcam experiences, uh, internship programs, and lots of community outreach. Really exciting stuff. So you might be asking, well, if we don't like them being in the tanks, why can't we just release them all? And we get that question a lot, and the answer is because captive-born animals, especially, do not have survival skills. And even those that were taken from the wild were taken when they were three, four years old, babies and they've been in the concrete tanks for forever, and they just don't have the skills to survive. 
Um, so we have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. Where are we looking? Both coasts. I just got back from Nova Scotia, my third trip there, and we've been to British Columbia and Washington State. Now, I'm not going to go through this because I don't have time, but suffice to say that when we're looking for a site, there's lots of factors you have to take into account, right? Some of them are environmental that have to do with the safety and appropriateness of the sanctuary site for the animals themselves, the right water temperature, uh, no pollutants. Some of it has to do with space for the animals. Do we have enough depth, enough land to give them the kind of life we want to give them? Um, and some of it has to do with society. We have to go through government permitting. We have to go through uh, often um, uh, discussions with First Nations peoples who own or are, ne are near the land that we're interested in, and just stakeholders and communities. We don't want to come in there and have all of the, the fishermen mad at us. I mean, it's just not going to work. Wherever we end up, putting a sanctuary, everybody's got to be in on it and happy about it and engaged in it. So we're down to about three different sites from 120 that we started from last year. These are the actual sites. I'm not allowed to actually say the actual day name. Um, but I can tell you that these are the actual sites in British Columbia, Washington State, and Nova Scotia. Our timeline is our timeline is that we again have just completed a decision to go with three priority sites with two or three other backups, um, and now we're getting into in-depth environmental analyses of those sites. Um, we hope to choose the first sanctuary and start to procure it next year. And we have a very ambitious timeline to actually have the first residence in the sanctuary by the end of 2019 or 2020. So that's what I want to say. Um, I want to thank you very much for listening. Please check us out on web on the web on facebook and twitter um, and i'm really happy to address any questions or discuss anything with the audience at this point hi um my name is maddie murray i am a junior hi. animal behavior major and aspiring marine mammal trainer um, mm -hmm. I had a couple issues with your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, the first being the video you showed of the orcas off the coast of British Columbia. Uh, off the coast of British Columbia, the orcas that tend to live there are southern resident killer whales most often. Um, and you use this video displaying you know, the wonderful life of orcas in the wild. However, the southern residents are currently experiencing one of the worst population declines in their history, as mm -hmm. well as malnutrition, boat strikes, and abundant infant death. Um, and I just believe that that is emotionally manipulative showing that wild orcas appear to have such a better life. Um, additionally, you claim that there have been no injuries to human lives reported from mm -hmm. uh, interactions with wild orcas, mm -hmm. when really there have been over four cases reported of um, injuries to humans after interaction with wild orcas, ranging from 1910 to as recent as 2005. I was just wondering if you had any responses to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, those were not southern residents that I showed, those were northern residents, and the northern residents are not endangered. Uh, second of all, you're absolutely right about the southern resident killer whales in Puget Sound in the Salish Sea. Um, they are uh, highly endangered, and they're highly endangered uh, for a number of reasons. One of the re several of the reasons is they don't have any food to eat, there's noise pollution, and they're really hanging on, and there's a lot of concern about them. Nobody's saying that free-ranging, that the natural life is, is free of any problems, just as we all have problems, we get sick, we die, and so forth, but 
there are those of us who believe that these animals have a right to live the life that they evolved to live. Um, and it is not as though the aquariums can make a claim that their animals are so healthy and healthy. They're not. They're dying left and right, and they die short lives. Um, and the other point is that one of the reasons why the southern resident killer whales are so endangered now is because of what happened in the 70s and 80s when they were captured by uh, the aquarium industry and which nearly halved their numbers. So they've been hanging on since then without the numbers of reproductive females that they need to weather other kinds of issues. Um, and those, all of those animals, with the exception of two, have died. Um, so they've been uh, exploited by the captivity industry. And your second question? Mm, just uh, yes, you claimed that no injuries had been reported. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, there may be, may have been some injuries. We don't, I mean, I'm not aware of them, but if there were, I certainly don't know of any deliberate attack on a human by an orca, free-ranging orca, and I have colleagues who swim at them all the time. Injuries happen all the time. The fact is, is that the only documented cases of orchids deliberately killing human beings has been in the concrete tanks. Hi, um, my name is Ryan Franklin. I am a senior art history major. Um, I guess my question is, um, I definitely commend your goal of creating these sanctuaries, but won't these sanctuaries itself have a limit and be trapping the whales themselves? So won't that be creating the same impact as if they were trapped in an actual aquarium, even though they still have more space? Yeah, it's a great question. Sanctuaries are still captivity. There's no way around it. There's nothing, I mean, you could make the sanctuary, you know, as big as you want, it's still captivity. But it is, in our view, the best alternative and orders of magnitude better than a concrete tank. Um, they will be able to dive. They'll be able to sw swim in a straight line for the first time in their life. They will be able to have variability in their environment. Fish can come in things, other sea creatures, they will have an uneven bottom, um, they will experience the weather. So yes, you're absolutely right, as we could never make a sanctuary big enough, but is it orders of magnitude better and in a sense a place where everything we do will be focused on how can we help these individuals thrive? That's the difference between a SeaWorld place and um, an aquarium, where a SeaWorld, the answer, the question has to be, and I'm not saying that they're evil or anything, I mean, they have to be, their business has to be the visitor experience, how do we make things the best we can for people that come in and buy a ticket. In a sanctuary, that priority changes and you, ask yourself every day, how can we make things the best we possibly can for the residents in the sanctuary? And that's the difference. That really is what I call the difference that makes the difference. So yeah, you're right, it's captivity, but since they can't all just be dumped back into the ocean, this is the best alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, you said the one whale killed himself by bashing his head against mm -hmm. the wall. Um, I wondered like, if that was intentional, like he wanted to kill himself or he was trying to get out because if he was actually trying to kill himself, that's a sign of like metacognition and like it thinking about like if it's life matters and that kind of thing. So Thank you, um, that's a great question. It's a very astute question. Um, the answer is that we don't know. We honestly don't know. It, it's really hard to tell. What we can say is that if an animal is in an enclosure and he or she bashes their head against the wall until they die, 
or they jump out of the tank, or they grate their teeth on the, the gates so that they have no teeth left, and on and on and on, that this is a disturbed animal. Now, whether those animals mean to end their life, that would mean that they'd have to have an understanding of that. And as you know, I mean, it's really difficult even with humans who commit suicide to know exactly what the intention is. We just know that it's, it's not good, whatever it is. So that's a great question. The outcome is the same, though. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. You want to go back? Oh, we'll go back and forth. Hi, my name is Marissa Boland. I'm from the hey. class of 2021 and Hi. a prospective animal behavior major. And a huge reason for that is actually when I saw blackfish. Um, and my question for you is the few sanctuaries that I've seen for wolves and other animals, typically they're getting them from situations where they were injured in the wild rather than having um, zoos and aquariums give them up. And I feel like SeaWorld, especially in response to blackfish, has been so uh, for lack of a better word, stubborn in defending their practices. Mm -hmm. So as far as acquiring the whales, even though the sanctuary seems like a beautiful idea, do you really think that they would willingly give them up or how would you acquire them or would it have to be a legal thing? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it's about the whales. Who are they? Where are we going to get them from? Who is going to give us an orca? Yeah. Or actually six to eight orcas, right? So here's the thing, and this is, this is really important to know, is that, well, first of all, in many sanctuaries, yes, these are injured animals who can't live by themselves in the wild, but many have been given up by zoos and circuses and are now living in sanctuaries. Um, and one of the people on our board is Ron Kagan, on our committee is Ron Kagan, who is the CEO of the Detroit Zoo. We work with the quote, zoo and aquarium industry. Um, because there are a lot of people now in the zoo and aquarium industry, including John Racanelli at the National Aquarium, who's sending his seven bottlenose dolphins to a sanctuary, um, who are now on board and getting more and more on board with the sanctuary idea. They see that this is not working for the animals. And in fact, it's not working for them. They're hemorrhaging. They're losing money by the day. Uh, the people just don't want to see these animals in concrete tanks anymore. So we have been talking with various people, and what we are doing is in the process of talking with them, just saying, look, you know, we want to make a better life for these animals. We know you do too. Let's do this together. Um, this is not about us versus them, about putting SeaWorld out of business. This is about creating a better life for the animals that they currently have. It's not just SeaWorld, it's Marineland Canada, up in uh, Canada where you saw Kiska, who's been all alone for 60 years. Right next door to her, there are two tanks stuffed with 55 beluga whales. 55 beluga whales stuffed into two tanks. Um, George Aquarium just had another death, a uh, beluga baby. It doesn't work. And, and we think that the people in the zoo and aquarium industry for these particular animals know that. Mm -hmm. We want to work with them, not against them. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm Nathan Miller. Um, I'm Nathan Miller. I'm a sophomore chemistry major. Um, so I'm from Boston, and so I'm into this sort of thing too. Um, so I've been going on rail watches since I was um, little. So my question is: Are rail watches any more or less um, humane or sensible, in your view or in the view of the literature, than sanctuaries? Whale well, watching? Yeah, like you know. Yeah, having, that's a great question. Having boats. So here's the deal with whale watching. It, it depends. It really depends on the practices. And now, for instance, uh, as was mentioned, the southern resident killer whales are endangered. 
and we, there are laws now in place to keep whale watching boats a certain distance from them to reduce noise. Um, and there's responsible whale watching and there's not responsible whale watching. Um, yeah, whale watching, you know, is, is a viable way. You're seeing the animals leading their lives in the wild. You get to know who they are. Um, but it has to be limited like, like, like anything. So it really, it really depends upon the, the company and how responsible they are. But it can be a, a risk to endangered populations and then you have to draw back a little bit. Good Thank question. <clears throat> um, my name is Cassidy Stone. I'm, an, I'm from the class of 2021. I'm an aspiring environmental science major. Right. So uh, expanding on the previous question, there's, um, I'm like, I'm not an expert, but is there any way that we could make these a sort of uh, more expansive, like a national park situation instead of an enclosed sanctuary? Yeah, that's a great question. So you have a vision here already of, of what the future might look like. Um, and the fact is, is that the answer is yes. So. As I showed you in the rendering there, you know, I mean, you don't get a real sense of the size, right, from a rendering. Um, and yes, we are looking for a cove or a bay that we cordon off, but we want this to be part of the environment. We want this to be a place where there's an interpretive center where people can come and learn not just about how, why they're here, why the orcas or belugas are here and not in concrete tanks, but about why we need to protect the oceans. And we take very, very seriously um, the goal to do a lot of environmental conservation education. We just recently brought on board Jean-Michel Cousteau, Sylvia Earle, and uh, Carl Sofina, who are three conservationists. And uh, that's because we think that our role will be not just to give a better life to a few individual whales, but to actually do real education about why it's so important to protect the oceans. Um, so yeah, that's, that's critically important. We're also going to do rescue and rehab. So, and that's an essential part of any place that you are able to take sick or injured individuals from the wild and rehab them and either release them back or keep them if they can't be released. Currently, um, when places like SeaWorld go out and rescue an animal, most of the animals, not all, most of the dolphins and whales end up with a one-way ticket to show business, okay? In concrete tanks, um, and we think that there is a better way for injured or sick free-ranging animals than putting them in a tank on display and giving them the best life we possibly can give them, given the limitations of whatever their health issues are. So that's a great, great question. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm I'm Hillary, I'm part of the class of 2020, and I'm a intended psychology major. I've been volunteering with the monkeys, and I was wondering how keeping the monkeys in a cement box might negatively affect them, such as keeping the crustaceans in a cement tank has affected them. Yeah, keeping any animal in a cement box is not a good thing. And not to be facetious, but it's, it's just not the way you treat other animals. And so um, you, the, a lot of the problems that you see in do dolphins and whales in concrete tanks are the same problems you see with primates who are kept locked up in small cages uh, that you see with elephants in small zoo displays and circuses and that you see in humans who are mentally disturbed as well. So we all have that in common, a very common set of, of responses to chronic stress. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, let's thank uh, Dr. Marino one last time. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much. Thank you.